Detectives say the 32-year-old cold case was cracked with the help from a deck of cards. On each card, a different cold case, whether it be a wanted person, a missing person, or an unsolved murder. Well, investigators say a prison inmate saw the victim's face on one of the cold case playing cards and then tipped investigators off. The Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department had the cards made up at the suggestion of a former cold case detective. I'm Tommy Ray. Cold case card program I started here in Polk County has since grown across the U.S. This is not your ordinary deck of playing cards. These cards contain 52 unsolved cases, and with every hand that's played, the stakes are unusually high. They've been dealt to inmates across the nation, and investigators are hoping their tips will stack the odds in favor of the house. Now it's your turn. These victims have been dealt an unfair hand, and it's up to you to deal justice. Somebody, somewhere, has information that could be investigators ace in the hole. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 6 of Dealing Justice. I'm Jennifer Dubasek. And I'm Lori Jennings. And today we're exploring the Nefertiri Trader case. She's a 33-year-old mother of three who vanished without a trace from outside her home in Newcastle, Delaware in 2014. It's been six long years, but her family and friends are not giving up on finding her and the people or person who abducted her. That's why sharing her story is so important. Her family and investigators need your help. My name is Brian Shahan. I'm with the Newcastle County Police Department's uh, Cold Case Homicide Squad. So back in 2014, I assisted Detective DeSabatino in the kidnapping case, Nephi Trader. So actually, ironically enough, I am the one who created the Cold Case Playing Cards. I stole the idea, so I brought that idea here to Delaware. So the three major departments in the state put in our cases. So as soon as we started doing this, Nephi's case was one of the ones that just stuck out, popped out, because there was just so many people that knew her. And we, we, we knew right away, you know, and, and it was a no-brainer to talk to her mom. And, and uh, that was one of the first ones we thought of. People talk in the prisons as if you see her picture. Uh, that's how hopefully we, we get things started. And, and obviously with the, you know, with the cards in the, in the prisons, you know, they are actually, they're able to get rewards as well in the prisons. Nephi is the queen of hearts. We haven't forgot about her. We, have, you know, we never will. Um, we just wish we could do more, but I, to be totally honest, that we, we definitely need the public's help. As always, our goal is to lay out the timeline and the pertinent details that may jog someone's memory. And obviously, we would love to see the day when there are no faces to put on the cold case playing cards. But until that day comes, we will continue working with Tommy Ray and telling these stories in pursuit of dealing justice. <laughs> time for us to solve these cases one card at a time. Help us deal justice for Nefertiri Trader. This is Episode 6, the Nefertiri Trader case. Queen of Hearts, Delaware Deck. This episode of Dealing Justice brings us to the first state of Delaware and the last place Nefertiri Trader was seen alive. Nefertiri Trader was Denise's first child. She was born on February 21st, 1981 in Wilmington, Delaware. Her mother, Denise Trader, tells us why this day was so very special. I had her on my birthday. She was my birthday present. And I named her after Nefertiti. She's the first black Egyptian queen. Yeah, Nefertiti was a queen. She was the queen of Egypt. My name is Diane Bunsen. I am Nefertiti's aunt. Nefertiri T was a beautiful baby girl. That was my first niece, and I'm, oh gosh, it was a beautiful day because it was a blessing for her to have her on her birthday. We were kind of shocked. We weren't expecting that, but oh boy, she was, she was very like crossed from here to there. You know, everybody was holding her, and everybody was, was so overjoyed and overwhelmed with her. Like the Queen of Egypt, Nefertiri ruled in her own right as the oldest of two sisters. Everyone called her Nephi, and Nephi was definitely a people person. Nephi is a, a very nice, easygoing person. She likes to have a nice time. She, she's a very funny person, and she likes to entertain. 
She was close to her sisters, and as her best friend Tanya says, her smile would definitely catch your attention. The most powerful thing about Nikki when you first meet her is her smile. And when I tell you it's incredible, I mean, it's incredible. Her eyes sparkle, they light up. She's like very captivating person, um, very genuine. The authenticity and her joy and her love for God. I have to tell you, Missy loves God so much. And Missy has such a beautiful heart. A bright smile, a loyal friend, and as a teenager, Nephi was known to be a lot of fun. In fact, Jay Charles remembers hanging out with Nephi as a teenager, thinking she was so fun. And then they discovered they were related. We showed up at the same family reunion. Matter of fact, was it a family reunion? It actually, actually might have been a funeral. <laughs> but it was a family, it was a family function that I first discovered. And this was way after high school was over. But it was at a family function that I discovered that we were actually family. Second cousin, if you want to get technical. And then after that, uh, we were usually just running to each other out and about on, you know, more of the nightclub scene. She was literally beautiful on the inside and out. And kind, wouldn't harm a fly. Absolutely sweet and generous, strong, independent. She was family oriented. Nephi started a family of her own and went on to become a mother of three two boys and a little girl. She was a good mom. She was a very good mother. She was a loving, kind, caring mother. She did anything for her kids, took them anywhere that they wanted to go, and she loves her kids. Her best friend Tanya recalls meeting Nephi for the first time and being young mothers together. I first met Nephi in 2004, actually in the beginning of the new year in 2004. I met her through her mom, Denise Trader, and the very first time I met her, we like bonded instantly. We went out and we just like do different things. I remember one of our most favorite things to do was go to Dorney Park, I think it's called in Pennsylvania. It's, yeah, so that's like Nikki's favorite place to take her children. So um, every year we would take them to like Dorney Park for their birthdays and always had a really good time celebrating. Nikki was on Facebook. She did have like a lot of posts. Her hashtags were always proud mom and go get her. Tanya and Nephi had such a great friendship, but living together in the same state only lasted four years. And Tanya and her then-husband moved down to Florida. But Nephi and Tanya remained great friends despite the distance. Even though I moved to Florida, it didn't change our relationship a bit. I got married, but we not only stayed in contact like on the phone at times that I would travel up to see her, Usually just in the events that I needed to escape, you know, domestic violence. And Niffy's door was always open for me and my children to be safe. Niffy was always such a person to just love you unconditionally, despite whatever choices. So even if she didn't agree with my choices, she always is so supportive of, and I'm saying is because I will never talk about her in the past tense. But she is a person who is um, supportive of you as a person, despite what you choose. As Tanya explains, Nephi was a true friend and always willing to help anyone. In 2014, Nephi was the main provider for her family, working hard at the local hospital. Uh, She worked at Christiana Hospital. She was a, a, a housekeeping at Christiana. She was in the process of working her way up to being uh, transported, transferring people from the car to the wheelchair to in the hospital. She was working her way up to do that. Tanya, her best friend, explains. When I tell you that she will work two and three jobs, I can tell you so many different years at different times, especially if it was getting ready to be Christmas time or one of their birthdays. She will take an extra side job along with her full time job. So that she could have those, the children always had those extra things. It didn't matter. She was a single mom. Niffy found a way. Focused on her family and making ends meet, Niffy lived in a two-story duplex in the subdivision of Saddlebrook in Newcastle, Delaware. She and her kids lived on the cul-de-sac on a street named Freedom Trail. Oh, yeah, it was a safe place, yes. It was a, it was a housing development. 
It was only one way in there and one way out. Nephi was a single mom and didn't want to complicate things with a relationship. She liked to keep things pretty simple, and everything was going great until June of 2014. June 27th, the last time Tanya would talk to Nephi. I'll never forget. The last time I heard from my sister was on my birthday, June 27th of 2014. And I call her my sister, although she is not my blood sister. We are, we are sisters in Christ Jesus, and she is one of my best friends ever in life. She said, sunshine, I, I'm at work. She was working at Christiana Hospital. She said, uh, no matter how busy I am at work, I will never forget your birthday. Happy birthday, sunshine. June 29th, 2014, the last time Nephi's mother would ever speak to her daughter and the last time her family would ever see her alive. June 30th, Monday morning, 4 a.m. It's an unusually early morning for Nephi, but she got up and took a quick trip to the local 7-Eleven. We know she made it to the convenience store as Nephi was seen on a surveillance camera at her local 7-Eleven on Route 273 around 4.20 a.m. She was wearing a pink sweatsuit and she was buying two cups of coffee, a loaf of bread, and a pack of Newport cigarettes. Now, who was the second cup of coffee for? Her mother, Denise, explains. But she had had two coffees. And when I talked to her daughter, her daughter said she was buying her a coffee because she liked drinking coffee with her sometimes. A mother takes off in the wee hours of the morning to get coffee, cigarettes, and a loaf of bread and leaves her adult cousin, teenage son, and young daughter sleeping. Nephi returned home, and in between her car and her front porch, she vanished. As day broke, her family inside were unknowingly enjoying their last moments of peace. Nephi's mother, Denise, was trying to call her daughter all day. It was unusual for the mother and daughter not to talk. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice. So unable to reach her on the phone by evening time, Denise drove to Nephi's house to find out what was going on. She knew immediately something was horribly wrong. I seen the bread laying in the yard. She had a loaf of bread that was laying in the yard. It had been squished. In other words, it had been stepped on. She had a pack of cigarettes laying um, on the porch. And her shoes was by her front door. Okay, so with me seeing all that, that showed me it was some kind of confrontation that went on. I had my daughter and her girlfriend go to door to door, asking the neighbors. Now, this was around 6 p.m., more than 12 hours after Nephi vanished. One neighbor they talked to had some shocking information. She had a neighbor that seen everything. It just so happened they went to that man's door, and he's the one that told them what happened. He seen the guy hit her in the back of the head with something and threw her in the back of her car and drove off with her. And she ain't been seen since. And he didn't call the police. And all that man had to do was call the police because it was only one way in that development and one way out. Why didn't he call the police, Denise? That's, That's what everybody wants to know. I'm yet to even see that man to question him about that. So with that being said, I called the police and I gave them the report. My name is Brian Shaham. I'm with the Newcastle County Police Department's uh, Cold Case Homicide Squad. Uh, but back in 2014, I assisted Detective De Sabatino in the kidnapping case of uh, Nephi Trader. She was in her vehicle uh, when she left that convenience store. Um, you know, we put out the, you know, what she was wearing and, and to, you know, to to basically have her kidnapped right in front of her house. It's not like this is a remote location where you know, it's out in the field and there's acres and acres. This is a neighborhood where the, you know, the next door neighbor's house is a couple feet away. And we do know that, you know, that she was seen you know, being put in the, the back of the car you know, by a neighbor. The neighbor, Joe Robinson, told officers he heard a loud noise at about 4 a.m. And when he looked out his window, he witnessed a man wearing tan shorts and a hooded sweatshirt dragging Nephi and throwing her into the back seat of her 2000 Silver Acura. This is what the witness told reporters at the time. I don't know what happened. Maybe he was taken to the hospital. When I came downstairs, the car was gone. News was spreading fast about Nephi's disappearance. Tanya recalls learning from a text message. In the middle of the night, after one o'clock in the morning, two days after my birthday, I got a text message on my phone. 
and it was from a 305 area code. And it said that somebody stole Niffy. <laughs> and my immediate response, I was outraged. I was mad. I thought somebody wanted to play games. There was already enough going on in my household, and I had had enough of domestic violence, but this took the cake. And I said back in the text message, who is this? This is not a joke. I just talked to my sister two days ago on my birthday. And the next thing I knew after I sent the text message, my phone rang and she could barely speak. But it was her little sister, Mattia. And Ty said, Tanya, somebody stole Niffy. And I said, what are you talking about? Somebody stole. How do you steal a person, a grown person? Like, Right. You know, and, and I just, I, I went off and Mattia was so distraught. She was still, I remember like not hearing her voice anymore and she was still talking. I mean, she was still on the phone, but she wasn't talking. I could, I could hear her breathing. I couldn't get any, I couldn't get her to say any other words. For almost an hour, I looked at a cell phone that had a person on the other line who was so distraught she could not say a word. And um, that was probably one of the worst nights of my life ever. I will never forget it as long as I live. Her cousin Jay had no idea until he logged onto social media. So I'm scrolling through Facebook one day, uh, mid-afternoon, and I seen, you know, a picture of my cousin. I seen a picture of Nephi. And the caption had said something to regards, uh, you know, oh, oh my God, or what happened, or this can't be true, or something to that degree. And, you know, I'm looking through the comments on that picture, and I'm trying to piece together what the heck is going on. And sure enough, maybe about two hours later, after I saw it on Facebook, uh, it was on Channel 6 News. Like, that's something that really happened. And even the news reporters at the time weren't even too clear on what had happened when it's close to home like that. You have no choice but to feel it. She was drugged out of her house at four o'clock in the morning. And not only did the neighbor across the street from her house, who was awakened from hearing her scream, not that they just like hear her, but they stated to the police that they watched her, what they called lifeless body being drugged out of her house by someone, and they never said male or female, wearing a hoodie and putting her in the back of her Acura and driving away with her. And mind you, these are neighbors who had lived, Nippy lived in that house for years. So they knew her. They knew that she was not into like, illegal activities or having strangers in and out of her house and things like that. Because later on, the neighbors changed their story and they said, oh, well, they thought maybe she needed help and somebody was helping her. That doesn't even make sense. Nephi's cousin Jay is convinced that had the neighbor immediately called 911, the outcome could have been very different. When you come out of her neighborhood, you can only go in two directions. One is a long road towards the intersection, and the other is a smaller road, but the highway is right there. County police on one side, state police on the other side. There's two busy roads that police patrol frequently. There is no way if that person would have saw the altercation occur, if they would have picked up the phone and called the police, there is no way that her, her vehicle, or anybody would have made it past a approaching police officer if someone had called the police while the altercation was happening. And that person first described the altercation as one way and then described it as another. And both of those ways indicate there was a problem. Her car went missing. What did somebody do, ride a skateboard there, then leave in her car? Like, come on, man. I know people don't like to get involved, but, you know, speak up. You see something, you got to say something. And you're not talking about a random stranger. You're talking about your neighbor, your young female neighbor that, you know, is a, a mother of three kids. Like, something happened. You've seen some type of altercation, and 
you didn't stand up and advocate for that in any way. Is that person to blame? Is that person at fault? For all I know, that person still is walking around with that weighing on their own conscience. I don't know. We know six years later, Nephew is still missing from that day, from what that person saw happen. We do know that. The eyewitness claims to have seen only one person, but her best friend Tanya has more thoughts on that. The neighbors stated that they saw one person. I will tell you this. No one single person did this. This was orchestrated by several people. I honestly don't believe it was just one person that night at her house. I have always had a very strong instinct because anyone who was super close to Niffy not only knew her routine, but also knew her house. And when they heard Niffy scream and she dropped that bread bag, to, that bread bag hit the floor. I honestly believe that she saw someone first and then someone grabbed her. And whatever happened in the in-between, that the neighbors only saw one person drag her out of her house. But there were several people involved in this. In the middle of the night at 4 o'clock in the morning, Christiana, Newcastle area, it literally would have taken less than two minutes to get from her house, driving the speed limit, less than two minutes to I-95 and to be at a chop shop in Philadelphia within literally less than an hour. Before daylight, that car was taken somewhere. I I don't want to go off into accusations and speculations of what I really believe in my heart to be true. Her car has never been found, her cell phone, which could have easily been tracked. And yes, they could subpoena those records today. They could still uncover the mysteries that have surrounded this case for so long and confirm the intuitions of of more than one person. Now, as a reminder, the police do not always release what investigative techniques they plan to use, and for good reason. They may have done a tower hit and they're not making it public. We just don't know. But what we do know is Nephi is still missing and so is her car. Uh, we've never found the car. We received a tip that, hey, I, you know, I think that you might want to check this body of water or under this bridge. We have done that, uh, and unfortunately, we have never been able to find that vehicle. But that, uh, her vehicle is still out there, um, and it's, you know, there's pictures on the website. But it is a silver 2000 Acura RL Delaware registration tag or plate of 404893. The last image of Nephi's car was captured by surveillance cameras from a Verizon store on North DuPont Highway. Her mother, Denise, knew something was seriously wrong. It was not like Nephi to disappear, and she says she would never leave her children, who were 7, 12, and 17 at the time. Her pocketbook, phone, and keys are also missing, and investigators were left with no viable leads. You feel very strongly that someone someone saw something, someone knew that it was happening. 2014 and now we're at 2020. So yes, we're hoping that, you know, if they don't feel comfortable coming to, uh, you know, the New Cascade Police Department, if they don't feel like calling and speaking to us directly. So the playing cards, you know, we made it so you can contact us honestly. Nearly one year later in 2015, the FBI got involved in Nephi's case. The FBI became involved due to unusual circumstances, their disappearance and the lack of information being received. The FBI will detail their contributions to this case, but Newcastle County has also added up to a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of someone involved in this case. Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to announce a $20,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of anyone responsible for the abduction of Nephi Trader. We believe that we can solve this case, but we need help, and we suffer as an agency, like many other agencies in the United States, with this code of silence. The real tragedy is not realizing when you have information that can solve this case and bring them some type of closure, the heartache that they're suffering, I think that supersedes this code of silence. We're asking for any and all help from the public, anyone that has any information, if you can lead us back to an arrest or you can just lead us back to nothing, we're glad to hand over the reward money. 
it's a it's a thirty thousand dollar reward leading up to you know, they say up to thirty thousand dollars. The Newcastle County Police put out a ten thousand dollar reward, and then the uh, FBI, who also is, is assisting us with this case, they put up an additional twenty thousand dollars. Even with the reward money being offered, no leads have come in. Again, here's Jay Charles, Nephi's cousin. There's a thirty thousand dollar reward out for information, and mm-hmm. nobody spoke out. What is it going to take for them to finally speak up? So do you say, well, dang, that must mean nobody knows anything at all? A friend of the family set up a Facebook page to try and get answers. My name is Malika, and I created the Facebook website page called Unknown. And it's about Nifty Trader who disappeared in 2014. The page has gotten a lot of publicity A lot of people are sharing about her. They're sharing her pics. We're getting it out there. But we still have not received any leads. And our main goal is to find out what happened to Nick because a person in their vehicle doesn't just disappear off earth. Someone knows something. And this is what the page is about, trying to get someone to break that ice and break down and contact the detective that's handling the case so that her mother can have some peace of mind and so that she can have a resolution and that she can rest that night. On March 28, 2017, Nephi's case took a turn, but not one the family expected or wanted. The Newcastle police announced Nephi was presumed dead. They did not announce what led them to that conclusion. However, they hoped this announcement would generate new leads in her case. So far, that has not happened. If you know something, you can change the outcome of this investigation. Despite the ruling, Denise Trader believes her daughter is still alive and she's out there being held captive. And she says she will never give up looking for her. She has a plea to anyone out there who knows anything. Tell us where my child is. Tell whoever they know that, that's old enough to release her and let that child come home. If it was their family member, what would they want somebody to do? They would want somebody to report it. I would appreciate it very much if they would ask God to give them strength and courage enough to come and step forward to tell me where my child is. Because she is loved so much and she is missed so deeply and we want her back. I believe that my sister is still alive. She is fighting for her life. Somewhere, a statement someone made to me in July 2014 when they said to me, I believe that Nippy's going to be found in Florida. Well, I don't know why they made that statement, and I won't speculate on that, but I will say this. I believe that. Her mom would give her life for her daughter. Her mom, no matter how hard the struggle has been, Nisi will never let up. And if there is anybody out there listening who did partake in this, you just need to know one thing. Nisi's not by herself because there is more of us that ain't going to ever let up. And we might not come at the force that Denise Trader comes at, but her mom will never stop fighting until she finds out what happens to her daughter. Whatever the circumstances are, I know and I believe in all my heart that she is fighting to try to find a way to get back home. I really believe that if anyone out there is listening that would care, that knows anything, and there are a lot of people, there's not just one or two people out there that know something. It's very unfortunate that fear, for whatever reason, people stay fearful and choose not to speak up. So I will tell you this, that I know that people that are very close to her at least one or two, know exactly what happened and are refusing to speak up and are refusing to tell the truth because they're scared. And for anybody out there, because there was one person that was seen taking her, but there was more than one person that was involved in this. There were several people. So I would plead with anyone who had a part to do with this not to worry about what will happen to you, but think about how you can Make up for it now by coming forth and telling the truth because the truth will set you free. Just know this, that we serve. And when I say we, I mean me and Niffy, 
We serve a mighty God, and he will fight and show himself mighty on our behalf, and he won't let our enemies triumph over us. So instead of continuing to stay silent, I beg you to please come forth. Tell whatever you know, and God will have mercy upon you. That is the best way I know to say it. Denise Trader speaks from a mother's heart. It's really been rough. Because I don't have no closure. And I think about my child every day. And I try not to get upset, but I do. I gave it all to God, but I still do. You know, I still do. It just upsets me just that much. Not knowing where she is or who it is that has her. I'm not giving I'm not giving up hope on my child though, I tell you. Denise Trader believes somebody out there has the answers and can bring justice for Nephi. But until that day comes, there's a Bible verse that she holds very close to her heart. Luke 8, 17. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. Thank you so much for joining us and listening to the details of Nephi's last days. We, of course, just would love to see something come to fruition, either a lead or, you know, obviously her mom is still holding on to seeing Nephi herself. This case is really terrifying that a woman can go to this local 7-Eleven and come home. We know she made it home. And literally something happened in between her house and the front porch. And I think that for anybody out there, you know, whether a woman or whether you have kids, the thought that you can vanish in in that small space. I mean, that's pretty terrifying. And the fact that there was an eyewitness for whatever reason, and he didn't call 911 at the time he saw this happening is also terrifying. That one phone call could have changed so many things in this scenario. Right. So the neighbor looks out of his window sees a woman being dragged uh, to her car and put in the back seat. And he says he doesn't call 911 because he he just thought it was some sort of medical something happening and that she was being taken to the hospital. I mean, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. None of us really know what our thought process is going to be when we witness something or we see something. And that's true because our mind sometimes, too, we don't want to automatically go to the worst. We want to rationalize something that's irrational that we're seeing. Mm hmm. Or you don't want to be the one to call 911 and they're like, dude, she was just being taken to the hospital. What's your problem? Exactly. However, I still think it's weird, but I'm allowed to think that he probably thinks he did all that he can do. And hopefully that's the case. But either way, we knew that what he witnessed was Nephi being taken. Right. In her own car and disappeared. Now, It is odd that he didn't call, but also he didn't have to tell investigators what he did see. So I know I go back to that, too. Like he didn't have to tell anybody, but he did. Right. And I don't think that uh, he's been a suspect. And the, the fact of the matter is nobody's a suspect. Exactly. There are no named suspects and they're frustrated with this code of silence that they feel is really being put up by people that know what has happened to her and why it's happened to her. And so they really feel that there is several people that know what's happened and nobody is giving up any information. Yeah. And some of the other scenarios that have been thrown out there was friends, boyfriends, husbands. There's been a wild mix of rumors of Uh, You know, people within her circle that kind of have other thoughts on things that could happen. But of course, we're not going to go down that path because we have there's literally no merit or evidence that we've been able to see or find. Exactly. But you know what is also terrifying? Is it simply as we've learned with other cases we've covered, it could be simply a stranger. Someone who saw a woman in her sweatsuit just getting some coffee and she was only 5'6". She only weighed 125 pounds and they followed her home. That's happened here before in Florida. Someone followed somebody home and killed her. And it does seem like, so she pulls in, she's got her cigarettes, she's got her bread um, and, you know, she's walking up to the front porch. Now, you know, of course... The bread being trampled and the cigarettes being thrown to the side. It just seems like that could have been the case, that she's walking in with these things in her hand, and before she knows it, she's attacked from behind. The fact that it's she was thrown into her own car, I don't know. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of moving parts in this case. I think one thing that stands out, it's rare to have no suspects. It's rare to have no leads, nobody coming in, nobody placing phone calls. And, you know, it just sounds like not a ton of people getting involved. We're hoping that you guys will change that. You know, somebody out there has information. Somebody out there has a little tiny piece of information or something they may know. And we're just hoping and praying that you guys will respond and you'll come forward with it. Right. And we want to remind you that the FBI is offering a reward of up to $20,000 for tips leading to an arrest in her case. And the Newcastle County Police Department is also offering up to $10,000 for information on her case. So combined, that's a $30,000 offer for information and possibly arrest of whoever has done something to Neffy. Now, if you have any information, you can call the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI or the Cold Case Squad directly at 302 395-2781. You can also report a tip anonymously to Crime Stoppers in Delaware, and that number is 1-800-TIP-3333. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Dealing Justice. Like us on Facebook at Cold Case Playing Cards for all the latest information on this case and other cards we'll be featuring on future episodes. Dealing Justice is written, produced, and hosted by Jennifer Dubasak and myself, Lori Jennings. Our sound design is by John Schaub. Our executive consultant is the Cold Case Playing Cards creator, retired FDLE Special Agent Tommy Ray. If you want to help us spread the word about these victims' stories, please subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends to subscribe. And please join us next time on Dealing Justice.